Hello techies, uh, data scientists, entrepreneurs. Today I'm really excited to talk about this new book called Monetizing Machine Learning Quickly Turn Python ML Ideas into Web Applications on the Serverless Cloud. So for those who know me, uh, who've been seeing my videos, my blog posts, uh, you know I've been harping a lot about the, 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 this kind of the lack of good applied data science material. This book is kind of like the bridge between ML and applied ML, data science and applied data science. So I'm hoping you know it does a little bit to fill the void. Uh, it's ironic because you know a lot of employees out there want people with applied data science experience. So we need more material, we need more classes on this topic. So I'm hoping this book will uh, you know will fill that void. I'm so excited about it. I'm going to read you a passage. Oh wait a minute. I just kind of stuck uh, the paper, where you see the printout you see in the back of your screen. I just, you know, stuck it on another book. It's going to be a lot thicker book. It'll be out in September. And if you've enjoyed the blogs, if you enjoyed the videos, it's just that in 16 chapters. And I'm going to walk you through these chapters through the final project. But what happens in this book is basically we start with a, a machine learning concept, an idea. We, uh, we, we get a data set, we explore the data set in a Jupyter Notebook, and we slowly build a, a web application uh, in Flask. Basically, web application is the great democratizer of your work. Anybody around the world can access it as long as they have a web, uh, you know, a web browser. Uh, so basically, anybody around the world can access your work. And then we're going to extend that on a serverless cloud. We're going to do Google Cloud. We're going to do Amazon Web Services. We're going to do um, uh, Microsoft Azure. And each one will rotate. And this will give you plenty of exposure to understand how to take an ML idea all the way to your customer's plate on the web into an interactive education educational smart uh, uh, you know way of uh, getting your work out there sharing your work even making money off your work so that's what this book is all about and let me walk you through the chapters so chapter one I'm not going to go through it because it's mostly about uh, uh, hello worlds on, on on GCP on Azure and on AWS and on, on, on some others so you know not much there uh, each chapter has a Jupyter notebook so here let me just open it up so each chapter for example this is a Jupyter notebook for chapter two and basically, uh, you go through the data, you explore it. We do some, you know, some typical EDA you do as a machine learner, as a data scientist, and eventually, and we start playing around with models, and then we build the Flask application, and then we extend it to the web. So let me show you the Flask application. So that's the fun part. Everything ends with a cool, uh, a cool um, web application to play with and to share your ideas. So here's the final product of chapter two. Uh, this is the web application in a local Flask mode. We will afterwards, you know, extend it to the serverless cloud, but you'll have to get the book to do that. I'm just gonna quickly walk you through each one of the final local Flask applications. So here we're using the Capital Bike Share uh, data set, and uh, it's basically about forecasting bike demand depending on time, weather, uh, and temperature. So let's, uh, for example, look at spring and zero degrees Celsius, we see we have 26 bikes. With those 10 degrees, it's getting warmer, 154 bikes are rented, 20, 282 bikes, et cetera, et cetera. So you get the point. So here, what's interesting about this chapter is we're using the regression coefficients. That means that we're pushing all the, the math, all the prediction uh, directly onto the client's machine. Nothing goes up to the server to do a prediction. So that's really cool in a way of creating lightweight predictive engines. This is the only chapter we do that. All the other chapters, unfortunately, not unfortunately, but it requires hitting up the server for, uh, to predict. So let me show you chapter, the next chapter. So here's the web application for chapter three. We're using a logistic regression in the cloud, so on the server. Uh, this is the Flask mode, so it's on the virtual, it's on the, you know, the fake cloud. But here, the first time you fire up your, your, your Flask application, it's actually gonna train the model, then save the model uh, in memory. Most of the other models we're gonna do in the next chapters, we have to pre-train them locally and load up a saved model. Here we're actually creating, training the model the first time we run it. Because we're using logistic regression, we can't pull it off because it's a very lightweight and nimble model. So uh, here we're gonna predict how, basically we get to create a, a passenger and predict how well they would have fared. So if you do a 30 year old female, uh, let's see how they fared. If you know the data set, you know they fared well, right? They had an 83.42% of surviving while the average was uh, under or right around 40%. You know, if you know the data set as well, you know if we try to mail around, you know, maybe around 40, you know what happens. I'll let you figure it out on your own. Uh, it didn't fare as well. Okay, chapter four is a really fun uh, web application where we get to predict the quality of the wine. So we're using that famous wine quality data set. Let me show you an example. Let's say I chose a white wine 
and we'll add a little bit more fixed acidity and let's lower the alcohol and there you go we got a lower lower quality uh, wine and if we increase the alcohol we get a much higher quality of wine right so this is fun because we're using a pre-trained gradient boosted model so we're training it locally mounting on the cloud uh, or in this case in the, in the local flask so that uh, it's ready to predict and it's also using ajax so this is, means that whenever we're changing one of these features uh, it's actually going to the cloud dynamically without refreshing the whole page so a really powerful tool when you're creating interactive web applications here is chapter six uh, you may have noticed that I skipped uh, chapter five. That's because chapter, there's a few chapters in here that are case studies and we build upon them as we go from chapter to chapter and I'll show you the end product, the last one. It's pretty cool. Uh, it's a powerful paywall, but uh, let, me, let, me, let me work my way up there. This is chapter six, also very cool. We're using Google Maps to show crime using the San Francisco uh, crime data set and you get to uh, predict or forecast in the future. Let's choose a date like um, August 20th, and it will show you where crime, it was gonna forecast crime using a heat map. I really like working with Google Maps. It's such a powerful and easy to use tool. You can pass it pins, heat maps, uh, locations, and suddenly you have a very powerful uh, way of, of, um, of sharing information using a web page and, and, and anything that you predict or machine learning using maps or latitude and longitudes. It's a great way to display that kind of information. Chapter seven is a lot of fun. We're using the, the Fame Golf data set, very small golf data set that's always used with Bayesian modeling. We're also using a Bayesian model here to predict whether you'll golf or not tomorrow. And we get the weather using the Open Weather Map API. It's gonna give us real forecasts for you know, the future. So let's see. Well, let's see if I'm gonna golf in Paris tomorrow uh, midday. Oh no, no golf, right? And maybe it's too hot. Uh, let's see, let's try Chicago or too humid, that could be too part of the problem. Yes, we will, right? It's a little cooler, so and a lot higher humidity, but a little cooler and overcast. So we're golfing in Chicago. So if you don't know where to go tomorrow, Paris, Chicago, and you want to golf, uh, go with Chicago. Chapter eight was so much fun, I end up wasting too much time playing with the end product. And that's what's nice about, you know, building web applications is you can really get the, you get to interact uh, uh, very easily uh, with, uh, you know, with your machine learning work. Here we pre-trained a TensorFlow model uh, using, you know, image modeling in the MNIST data set to predict, uh, to have our little uh, Fakir here predict digits. So I can just draw the number seven. So it's very interactive. You get a canvas and look at that. Look at the hat of the Fakir, you see seven we pre predicted it correctly. Let's try an eight. I know it struggles with the eight sometimes. Nope, good job here. And let's try one more, let's try a one. Yes, wow, it did a really good job. What's fun about this model is you can, you know, train your model with only a few epochs and see how it does a poor job predicting digits. And you can then predict it for a huge amount of time. And we'll talk about that in the Jupyter Notebook, what are appropriate times, what is recommended for that model. And suddenly it predicts digits in a phenomenal way. So a great way of showing complex models and also mounting in, in, mounting in the cloud or in Flask, pre-trained models, uh, you know, very powerful cutting edge models. So here we're gonna skip chapter nine as part of the case studies and I'll show you the end product. Instead, we're gonna jump directly to chapter 10 where we're using singular value decomposition and the movie lens data set to predict, to give recommendations. So uh, you choose your movie genre, let's do, um, you know, children. And let's choose um, 101 Dalmatians. We'll go with this one. Here, let's choose something else here. Let's go with Benji. And let's go with uh, For the Birds. And we, we click the Get Recommendation bot button. It's gonna take into consideration the movies you've seen and uh, you know, recommend Lion King. And it will also, it will not only pull the movie description from Wikipedia API, easy to use, and also uh, pull the, the first image it find on Wikipedia API. So here you kind of have, you know, a, it feels like a real uh, recommendation engine on the web. So pretty powerful, pretty cool. It also gives you, uh, you know, other movies like 101 Dalmatians and Chicken Run as additional recommendations. Chapter 11 is also a lot of fun, but in a, in a kind of almost a, a, a more important way. Here we're using uh, web applications and their, the very interactive nature of the application to explain, to teach people about uh, very, you know, tough concepts in, um, in data science. So here we have this interactive uh, um, ROC curve, receiver operating characteristic curve, and 
we, we, we basically can you know, choose the cutoff threshold of our predictions of our model. So in most cases, right, if a model says, you know, if a model is above 0.5, you say, okay, there's a problem, it's a true. If it's below 0.5, you say it's false, right? That's kind of the, the, the common cutoff when you have a probability. Anything above 0.5, oh, it's gonna be true, below, it's gonna be false. But it doesn't have to be that way at all. You can choose any cutoffs you want. So here we're using the famous spam and ham data set, which is a, um, uh, a data set full of SMS messages with most of them are good messages and a few of them are spam, basically garbage, they're trying to sell you stuff. So with the, with the standard 0.5 cutoff, we see that we are capturing good messages 87.1% or 87% of the time. We are, correct, we are correctly um, uh, labeling spam as spam 5% of the time. Now, we are, uh, we are mislabeling 7.5% uh, of spam as ham, meaning you have some spam going in your inbox, and we are wrong on 0.5%, half a percent of your good messages are going to the spam box. So the problem here is that people have zero tolerance, right? Nobody wants their, their good messages to be in the spam box. They don't want to miss a good message. So what you have to do is you have to play with the curve until you find an, an area that, that, that satisfies your modeling goal. So let's go up the curve. So here I'm now at one, and now we're, we're only capturing 13% of the messages as uh, uh, you know, uh, good messages as good messages, but 74% of your good messages are ending up in the spam box. So we're going in the wrong direction. So let's, go on, let's try going below 0.5, let's go 0.3. Ooh, 0.3, perfect, look. None of your uh, good messages are ending up in the spam box or the spam filter, this is perfect. So let's see what it means. It means 87% of your good messages are, are good messages, 0.75% of your spam messages are correctly labeled as spam, and 11.78% of your spam messages are in your inbox. So this, this is your cost right here. That means you're gonna have 11.78% of the, of the spam messages are gonna be thrown in your inbox. That's the cost of never missing a good message. So this is an important concept. It's very, actually a very complex concept to understand that you don't always go with a 0.5 probability cutoff. And in this case, you have no tolerance for uh, your good messages ending up in your uh, spam box, but that's not always the case. Think about healthcare when there are very limited resources. You would rather be above 0.5 because you wanna make sure that those you predict as being sick are really, really, really sick versus those that you think are sick or maybe are sick, you don't wanna waste your limited resources, your limited staff on them. So that's another way of playing with the probability curve to make sure you get the best quality uh, predictions. Chapter 13, we're looking at Google Analytics. Really powerful tool if you have your own website to understand who goes to what page and who doesn't or where they come from and how, long how much time they spend on each uh, page. Uh, an important chapter, I'm not gonna show it because there's not that much to show uh, in terms of a web application. In chapter 14, we go over A-B testing, a great tool to understand if people prefer you know, a certain design or a certain background color. In chapter 15, we start looking at subscribers. Uh, also very important. In chapter 16, the last chapter, and that's what I'm gonna show you right now, is I love that chapter because we're building a real paywall. So let me show you what it looks like. So this is the pair trading booth. This is chapter 16, though we are actually building this pair trading booth throughout uh, the chapters in the book. It's a case study where we build upon it. So we start in chapter five, chapter nine, I think uh, chapter 12, and then uh, in, this, in, in, in chapter 16. Uh, so what, we, what this, this web application is all about is a, a website that gives trading recommendations. First, we look at stock market data. Uh, in, in next chapter, we look at bringing uh, charting, dynamic charting. And, and next, we bring in fundamental data using NASDAQ and Wikipedia. And finally, we build this paywall. So before I, I, I log into the paywall, I wanna talk about paywall. So chapter 15, we do talk about subscribers, you know, um, uh, simple ways of doing it, but that's just for, for you know, internal projects, demos. Whenever you're dealing with real customer information, sensitive customer information, or financial information, you always want to uh, push that work onto somebody else. Leave the professionals do it. You know, leave PayPal, Stripe, whatever. Let those people who do it very well do it. And in case your site gets hacked, uh, they can't get any sensitive information. You won't get in trouble. That's what I recommend. If there's a plugin for something uh, hard to do or sensitive, use the plugin. I, you know, hands down, the best way to do it. So here we're using Stripe and Memberful, and I click on Login. And look at that, it's gonna bring a professionally looking uh, login box. And I hit sign in. And there we are, we've gone through the paywall and then the information I put in, everything that's not held on my own site, right? It's not in this web application site, which I'm gonna show you how to build here in the book. It's 
on uh, member phone and Stripe. That's the beauty of it, right? We're pushing all that sensitive information, letting them deal with the, the, the secure part, you know, the HTTPS, encrypting the information on their end, right? That's what you want to do, especially for sensitive information. So let me just show you a quick walk you through uh, this site. We are looking at uh, the Dow 30 stocks and we're asking for which are the ones that are diverging the most from their index. So you say get trade, you give your budget and it recommends buying 22.98 shares of you know this symbol at this price or and shorting this one so at this price so you're doing a pair trade uh, again this is just you know educational for fun don't you know don't don't you know do the pair trade uh, and then we can see view charts it will show dynamic the two charts MMM Bank of America and it will show what the divergence is and you can see it's very divergent so that's why it's recommending the trade and you can also also pull fundamental information will tell you the, the company, company name, uh, the market capitalization, even give you some links to get more information, as well as, you know, a snippet from Wikipedia. And I can log out of this site, and now I can't get, there's nothing, I can't access that information anymore. That's the beauty of it. So what's really cool about, about uh, using these kind of tools here is when I click login, right, it's popping a, 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 you know, a login box. It's, this is not my login box, right? This is login box through Memberful. So that's what's powerful here. It looks like it's the login box of the site. It looks like a professional looking website with its own, you know, login. It can take credit card payments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, except it isn't. And that's gonna be our dirty secret, right? And that's what you wanna do. Push the sensitive information onto somebody else. Let the pros do what they do so you can focus on your machine learning and on you know sharing your machine learning to the world. So that's it. That's machine learning, you know, monetizing machine learning. Uh, I think it's a book that is direly needed. It's a very unique book. So that's it. If you like my blog posts, if you like the style of blogging I do, the style of videos I do, very applied, very practical, where we start with an idea and we finish with a, with a polished product, this book is for you. Uh, I want to quick give a shout out to everybody, the community who helped me build this book. Uh, my friend Mehdi Rupai, who co-authored it, he helped with the concepts, the data sets, and the reviewing of the book. Uh, my friend Rafael Bush and Matthew Katz, they helped with the technical writing and, and going through the exercising, make sure it made sense. Uh, my, my, my son, Luca Samunategi, did all the artwork. So all the artwork you're seeing on the web pages, that's his work. And everybody at A-Press Media who, who is publishing this book, who are publishing this book, um, a tremendous help. In particular, the editors, Rita Fernando and Susan McDermott, who really helped uh, make sense of the book and keeping me on track. So it really is, uh, you know, the work of a lot of people. It took a long time to build. It will be out in September. And like I said before, you know, I'll bother you more about it. I mean, I'll you know, inform you about it, uh, you know, as soon as it's out in September.